Welcome, everybody, uh, to this week's bonus episode of Left Reckoning. Hanging out this evening with Matt Luck, as always. How's it going, brother? That's going well. How do you, David? I'm doing pretty good, man. I'm uh, really looking forward to this. We're talking about none other than my one of my favorite theorists and thinkers, Vladimir Lenin. In fact, uh, a little behind the scenes, I have my little bust <laughs> of Lenin on my desk that I always keep up there. I'm really... Excited to break down some of his thought and work. I mean, you know, we, we've we done a few of these kind of more historical theoretical readings. We did a critique of the Goth program with Marx and a few others. And I know we're sort of doing a kind of leapfrog version of this stuff, but I think it's it's worthwhile just because everybody is sort of at different places. And I don't really feel the need, at least right now, to do the kind of traditional like introduction to Marx, right? Everybody reads like the German ideology, a, a text a little bit from the Constant Manifesto. And if they get to Lenin, it's like a couple excerpts from um State and Revolution or maybe Imperialism if they're um if they're being taught by somebody in the know. Um but yeah I, I I'm really excited to sort of break down these texts because it sort of shows um the full spectrum of lenin lenin as a theorist in the first text and also Len lenin as a little bit of a polemicist um and and radical and revolutionary i um, in the second text the uh um letters to the american working uh, class the american workers um so i don't know i mean do we I, we probably don't need to do too much biography on lenin i think most people are familiar with him um but maybe just to bring people up to to Speed. Lenin's an important thinker to read and to deal with um, because he was a titan in two different fields that most um, people are, are, are sort of rarely in. By that I mean he was an incredible political theorist. Like his writings just like if Lenin, if, if the Russian Revolution didn't happen, right, um, Lenin would still be read widely. Uh, because of his work in political philosophy and, and in Marxism in particular, right? Like he is incisive. Um, he really developed Marxism um, into a political force. Um, but that's not all that he did. I mean, he was an incredible leader of of the Bolsheviks um, and led, you know, one of the most successful, uh, you know, communist revolutions in human history. Um, and today's not going to be a kind of, you know, tit for tat scorecard of the Soviet Union and a little bit more sort of looking at what Lenin has to teach and what Lenin has to say. Um, but I don't know. He's, he's the only other people I can sort of think like that is maybe like a Che Guevara. Right. Um, and I don't mean this as any kind of just by any means to discredit Che, but I think Lenin stands um, a lot taller when it comes to his theoretical contributions. Um, yeah. You know, so, you know, just briefly, like, you know, Lenin was, didn't come from a working class family, he came from a kind of small landholding family he goes to school. He was involved in a lot of early anti-Czarist um, movements. His brother um, famously actually was killed, was executed by the state um, for revolutionary activities. And there's some kind of, you know, these are the problem when you're a figure like this. There's so much like myth making and it's hard to know what's true is what is fact. Um, but apparently um, his brother was sort of wrapped up with a kind of a very performative kind of I mean, performative might be uh too much of a euphemism i mean like a radical like we're going to throw bombs in in public squares you know and try to assassinate a political leaders group of anarchists um and and lenin uh you know some have said that lenin thought that his brother was quote like an idiot um for pursuing that kind of revolutionary activity and for people who know lenin and lenin's work this does not mean that lenin had any kind of problem with political violence um but a little bit more um the problem that he had more so with was this kind of like individual acts of violence and like spectacle, um, which end up becoming sort of dominant forms post, you know, 1960 amongst the left too, right? This kind of idea that like, we just need a big thing to like wake the people up. Anyways, I digress a little bit, but it's just interesting to learn before he really became like a socialist and a Marxist, him already having those kind of leanings. Um, he goes to school. He, um, he trains to be a lawyer. Uh, he uh, is always fighting with the officials of the university. He's fighting with the czarists. I mean, he very quickly, so with the czarist forces, the, the forces of the monarchy, he very quickly gets sort of wrapped up in the international socialist 
uh, movement and becomes one of the great leaders of the early Russian uh, socialist movement. And remember that Lenin, you know, not only was a, a member of the, the very famous revolution we know, 1917, but he was also, um, you know, a player in 1905 uh, when there were just massive democratic reforms in the country because of, uh, you know, mass mobilization of people. Um, so he lived through two revolutions, frankly, right? A bourgeois revolution, 1905, similar to, you know, the French or the American in some ways, and then a communist revolution. Um, so just on that nature, this is somebody whose historical perspective is worth um, engaging with. Um, and he was somebody who uh, read Marx, uh, you know, and understood Marx like truly like no other. Um, He's somebody, and we'll get to the writings in a second, so I don't want to front load it too much, but somebody who just writes, um, he, I mean, one of my favorite quotes by Lenin, I don't know if you're familiar with this, Matt, um, but he, he said, um, you know, a revolutionary must have their heart on fire and their head on ice. And you get that with the way he writes. <laughs> yeah, I, it's interesting. And um, the other thing is talk about his anti-Czarism. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, I think, important context for... Uh, it's it's obvious but you know you don't really to put it in such like in like it came one after the other right and mm -hmm. you say him you see him commenting in the second text about the american revolution it's like um taking it more seriously than i think is more is sort of the uh the sort of mode now like mm. right like it actually like l looking at it seriously and admitting it's a bourgeois revolution but you know like I, I and obviously he he nods at like we mentioned earlier on uh, on uh, Wednesday the uh, civil war as being the significant one. But um, anyways, I I thought that was interesting. And also, oh, just another note on the anarchy thing, mm -hmm. um, where he uh, was against the bomb throwing sort of. Um, uh, that's funny because Wild says he. I, I was looking for the quote and I can't find it. I might have deleted it. I don't know what happened, but he was asked if he's a, is a, what's he thinks about socialists. He's thinking he's actually more of a socialist and he was even maybe an anarchist, mm -hmm. but the bomb, po the policy of bomb throwing is absurd. Uh, right. So it's, it's interesting. Like that was the, mil that was like the sort of like thought process about that kind of anarchism in, uh, at that time. It was uh, and, and going around. Should know. Too that like you know I mean just if you're not sort of like a student of of this part of the world and its history like there were many many Russian anarchists and it's a very rich and and bold and 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 uh, you know beautiful and respectful tradition I, I don't I don't want to sit here and like dog on it too much right, um, right. you know it was, it was a very serious attempt to try to do something uh, different but again I'm you know I'm a Marxist and I think that there's a a, 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 a revolution perspective that ends up ends up being much fuller um, and more effective but. Yeah, no. I, I, mean, I have the quote here. Yeah. Um, he, uh, he says, uh, the conversation drifted into politics. We are all of us more or less socialists nowadays, he remarked. Our system of government is largely socialistic. Uh, what is the House of Commons but a socialist assembly? Of course, you know, we, there's, there's uh, uh, you know, yeah, responses cool. to, made, to be made to yeah. these. But uh, I, think I, I think I'm rather more than a socialist, he added laughingly. I'm something of an anarchist, I believe. But of course, the dynamite policy is very absurd, uh, indeed. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's wild, Ian, right? Yeah. <laughs> like through and through. Um, <laughs> I love, I love Oscar Wilde so much. Um, but yeah, I mean, Jesus. I mean, we're, we'll do a Lenin episode to break down more of this stuff. I think we should just get to the text. But it should be noted for people um, who are unfamiliar, you know. Lenin spent a lot of his adult life in exile, um, and he returns to uh, to Russia during the Russian Revolution. It had already started um, by the time um, Lenin showed up. And in fact, the German government, the Kaiser, um, sent Lenin. Um, they apparently paid for his uh, train tickets to return to uh, Russia with the hopes that, you know, sending Lenin back, back there would sort of destabilize, you know, the czarist, um, government enough to sort of give the Germans an opportunity to take it over. Um, <laughs> which is a kind of very, it's a very funny kind of historical, um, accident, frankly, uh, that these kind of old powers of Europe thought they were, you know, these kind the, the words and, and the, the possibility of socialist revolution, they didn't treat it as something that was very serious. Uh, something that would just sort of be a thorn in the side of the, of the monarchy. Um, and Lenin, along with others, proved that perspective very, very wrong. Um, right. but anyways, uh, um, Lenin is, is somebody who I think is, is worthwhile to read. And uh, 
maybe if I just want to add any last kind of not disclaimers, but just ways to think about Lenin. One of the things I think um, is so great about Lenin as a Marxist um, is that he's not dogmatic, right? He recognizes, and you'll see this, even though some of the terminology he might use in this first text um, that we're going to read, um, the three sources and three components of Marxism um, might, because they're very passionate, might seem like they are, uh, you know, like that he's extremely dogmatic. Um, but Marx, I mean, sorry, that Lenin really understood Marxism as a dynamic philosophy. So it's a philosophy that's constantly taking inputs from history, from, you know, politics, from what's going on around them in the world um, and recognizing um, what there, what needs to be done. And I think it gets actually very clear in the second text when he starts talking about the early pacts that the, uh, the Soviet Union made. Um, to end World War One, but we'll get there in a second. But I just think that, like, if anything, like beyond just the kind of revolutionary fervor and, and like the the clarity with what she talks about Marxism, I think that one of the great legacies of 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 Lenin, in addition to his revolutionary spirit and accomplishments, um, is actually his kind of how dynamic he was as a thinker. He was never sort of set um, and and unmoving, and I think that that's something that's worthwhile to sort of aspire to be like. Yeah, I mean, I don't have uh, the experience with. Uh, Lenin as you do but his practicality is what's always been interesting to me um, and the way he approaches you know just the situations that he's in it seems always fairly reasonable which I again we could just do a whole like episode just of you and I sort of talking about Lenin in general I, I, I know I keep on saying we gotta get to the text but I have to say as somebody who is like you know considered myself to be a Leninist in some fashion for for most of my adult life now um I do get very annoyed at a lot of the people who sort of invoke his name and, you know, people who call themselves Marxist Leninists, for example, who are just for the most part, a lot of performers um, and, uh, and uh, you know, extreme dogmatists. I mean, head in the sand kind of folks. Um, and it was just frustrating for me to see Lenin's good name sort of associated with the kind of most fanciful um, kind of online movements uh, today, because he's a thinker who I, I very much like I, I regularly return to. And I, I always find something, worthwhile in Lenin's writings. But let's get to this. Yeah, so we'll use a Balaboka, the software, to uh, play this here. Oh, wait, and before we get, I mean, sorry, not to do too much introduction, but this first text is a very short text, and it's Lenin actually very clearly sort of explaining what he considers to be the three main sources and components of Marxism. Throughout the civilized world the teachings of Marx evoke the utmost hostility and hatred of all bourgeois science, both official and liberal, which regards Marxism as a kind of pernicious sect. And no other attitude is to be expected, for there can be no impartial social science in a society based on class struggle. In one way or another, all official and liberal science defense wage slavery, whereas Marxism has declared relentless war on that slavery. To expect science to be impartial in a wage slave society is as foolishly naive as to expect impartiality from manufacturers on the question of whether workers' wages ought not to be increased by decreasing the profits of capital. But this is not all. The history of philosophy and the history of social science show with perfect clarity that there is nothing resembling sectarianism in Marxism, in the sense of its being a hidebound, petrified doctrine, a doctrine which arose away from the high road of the development of world civilization. On the contrary, the genius of Marx consists precisely in his having furnished answers to questions already raised by the foremost minds of mankind. His doctrine emerged as the direct and immediate continuation of the teachings of the greatest representatives of philosophy, political economy, and socialism. The Marxist doctrine is omnipotent because it is true. It is comprehensive and harmonious, and provides men with an integral world outlook irreconcilable with any form of superstition, reaction, or defense of bourgeois oppression. It is the legitimate successor to the best that man produced in the 19th century, as represented by German philosophy, English political economy, and French socialism. Just to jump in there, <clears throat> I that's not, I can understand why someone who um, that sounds like culty or something like that, right? Mm. But I think like there's I, I first of all buy it, and I realize that some like Sam Harris talk about meditation. It's like either you get it or you don't. Um, <laughs> And it's an unfalsifiable, but I, I think this is why Hitchens even and Burgess has a better handle of this, and we'll talk to him about it. But like even late, he was saying like 
even if I don't consider myself a Marxist, I still think in the terms of like the dialectic, right? And that sort of stuff. Like, yeah. I, I, I do think it is complete. It's, it's demystifying in a, in, in a, in a way that makes all makes, makes history really, I think, um, digestible. Like I'm reading, uh, the fucking Shakespeare plays, um, the Henry ad. So mm -hmm. Richard the second through Henry the fourth, Henry the fifth, Henry the sixth and Richard the third. And you know, like, uh, that like the very first um richard the second he's like you're the landlord of of uh of uh of britain or whatever like like these sorts of things are constant this is a constant like churn of actual history right mm -hmm. um and i i i think it sounds like a convert but it's i think it's true i mean for sure like some of the language might be freaky for folks i think one i mean yeah I don't want to spend too much time on like focusing too much on, on the rhetoric. But yeah, I, would, I mean, I wouldn't write like this today, um, but there's a couple of things in here that like are funny and like, we'll get to it later in, in this text. One thing that really freaks out a lot of folks is the term Marxist science. Right. Um, and it's actually, I think more emblematic has less to do with the actual text and what these people are arguing and more of the way that, that we've been sort of taught to think, about our kind of understandings of society and our understanding of history in the United States, which is you know the country I know best, right? When people get worked about the term science, well, how could you say Marxism is a science? And yet half of these people who make these kind of claims, they got a degree from their university called political science, right? Like there is like an aspiration to have a kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, neutral sort of outside of you know you know being a partisan understanding of, of of society that has always existed um in the humanities and it's a great tradition that's one of the things that you were saying even with hitchens saying that like even if he drops all of the belief in world revolution he still considers himself to be a marxist um on some level because the level of analysis the the points that it's making um he finds to be very much true i mean i um i truly like I would hate to find myself in that position, I must say. Um, but I definitely understand the uh, where, where, what he means by that. It's like it's, and this is why again, I, I we I really want to get into this text because one of the big hopes that I have with this is to start to show people the tools that Marxism really does give us in analysis, um, and for people to stop thinking about like how you talk and think about Marx as a kind of like dedication of, of your faith, because I do see that a lot on the kind of contemporary American left, right? Is I think a lot of people not realizing that like there has been plenty of like utopian socialist movements that sort of preceded uh, Marx and Marxism and, and Lenin and, and the Soviet Union, um, you know, that were all about morality. And like, it doesn't take a lot to see that the system feels very immoral. Um, but the kind of scientific aspects of Marxism that Lenin is going to lay out, these three key components, um, I actually really do think are, are critical um, uh, for, for, um, for, for building your kind of political education in a way that can help these causes of, of workers' movements and workers' revolutions in ways that the kind of like more... Because some people think that Marx is just like a big... Like he wrote 500 pages on like, the bosses suck, workers are the best you know, fuck the state, right? It's like, you yeah. know, it's like he's talking about coats and like how our labor, how like the value that we create is like extracted from us. Um, and it's not saying that all of our political conversations need to be extremely dry. Um, but I do think that sometimes people sort of, I don't know, consider Marx to be like a, like a position of like, <laughs> like, like emotional weight, like Marx is just the guy who was just the most worked up about this in history. And like, no, I mean, there's plenty of people who can write really beautifully about oppression and, and, and how they would like to see a better world. I mean, that's what, you know, so much of European literature in this period of time was doing as well. Uh, what Marx was able to do was sort of bring in these concepts of philosophy and politics and economics in a way that sort of started to ring true about us. And like, I don't, I guess what I'm saying is like, the point about Marxism is that like, even though it does have a call to action within it, there is a scientific aspect to it too that could actually be wielded by, um, you know, even your opponents, for example, right? Because it's like a mode of analysis. And I think Lenin makes that very clear here. Right. Okay. It is these three sources of Marxism, which are also its component parts that we shall outline in brief. I, the philosophy of Marxism is materialism. Throughout the modern history of Europe, and especially at the end of the 18th century in France, 
where a resolute struggle was conducted against every kind of medieval rubbish, against serfdom in institutions and ideas, materialism has proved to be the only philosophy that is consistent, true to all the teachings of natural science and hostile to superstition, Kant, and so forth. The enemies of democracy have, therefore, always exerted all their efforts to refute, undermine and defame materialism, and have advocated various forms of philosophical idealism, which always, in one way or another, amounts to the defense or support of religion. Marx and Engels defended philosophical materialism in the most determined manner and repeatedly explained how profoundly erroneous is every deviation from this basis. Their views are most clearly and fully expounded in the works of Engels, Ludwig Feuerbach, and Anti During, which, like the Communist Manifesto, are handbooks for every class conscious worker. But Marx did not stop at 18th century materialism, he developed philosophy to a higher level, he enriched it with the achievements of German classical philosophy, especially of Hegel's system, which in its turn had led to the materialism of Feuerbach. The main achievement was dialectics, i.e., the doctrine of development in its fullest, deepest, and most comprehensive form, the doctrine of the relativity of the human knowledge that provides us with a reflection of eternally developing matter. The latest discoveries of natural science radium, electrons, the transmutation of elements have been a remarkable confirmation of Marx's dialectical materialism despite the teachings of the bourgeois philosophers with their new reversions to old and decadent idealism. Mar um, so... I just wanted to note, and um, we'll get right back into it. Um, one, the pronunciation is hilarious with the thing, the, the foyer bar, however he said foyer bar, <laughs> very funny. Um, and two, um, I think it's really critical to note, and, and this next section that we're going to play is, I think, where it really gets distilled clearly, um, how crucial materialism is as a philosophy, not only today, but then. Um, when there was so much superstition still floating around. Um, I mean, this is a time, even though it seems ridiculous today, you know, of, of you know, the, the late monarchy um, where people had, you know, blood rights to things. It just, it might seem, you know, completely um, absurd. But, and, and this is a, another reason, like, if you're a young Lenin, like reading what Marx is saying, and you're seeing what's going on around you, right? You're seeing like medicine advance dramatically um, and the superstitions of old sort of being overcome. Um, and it's completely reasonable and, and true to also start to, you know, believe and to see that that is also happening in our understandings of political economy and in, in law as well. Um, but this next section right here, I think, really is, is the critical point to understanding dialectics, if that's still a term, because people throw that around. And I think not everybody, um, uh, you know, understands necessarily what that means. But this is a good text on it. Marx deepened and developed philosophical materialism to the full and extended the cognition of nature to include the cognition of human society. His historical materialism was a great achievement in scientific thinking. The chaos and arbitrariness that had previously reigned in views on history and politics were replaced by a strikingly integral and harmonious scientific theory, which shows how, in consequence of the growth of productive forces, out of one system of social life another and higher system develops how capitalism, for instance, grows out of feudalism. Just as man's knowledge reflects nature, i.e., developing matter, which exists independently of him, so man's social knowledge, i.e., his various views and doctrines philosophical, religious, political, and so forth, reflects the economic system of society. I'm sorry to be tedious here, but this is the, this is the line that I think is really critical for people to understand um, about, about, about materialism as, as a philosophy here. You know, that might just seem like he's inverting two different things in, in that line, but what he's saying there is actually really critical. He's saying, just as man's knowledge reflects nature, in essence, developing matter, right um so our knowledge is not creating the world around us our knowledge is reflections of the world around us um our social knowledge um reflects the kind of economic systems the material reality of the society that we are in and what does lena note here um what are what is our social knowledge our views our doctrines our religious beliefs our philosophical beliefs and so forth right those are reflections of the actually ongoing um material beliefs in our society right it's a very radical claim and very different from a lot of people like in the enlightenment tradition so a marxist view for example of Locke, 
would be Locke is a reflection of the economic system of the society in which it was created, right? Where a Lockean would believe that what, you know, Jean Locke is saying when he's saying that, you know, if you do some minor development on the, the dirt around you, it's okay if you kill all the Native Americans in, in the United States, right? Where they would believe that this is like some kind of universal truth. Marxism and its analysis of that, that idea is actually saying like, no, this reflects the economic system that those ideas came out of, right? This is a really, really critical um, point um, and, and, and why this kind of view is, is crucial, not just in the level of, you know, building political parties and sort of like arming ourselves with why the world is unfair, right? But understanding why people believe the things that they do and why those things, um, why those ideas sort of developed and why, you know, they're sort of taught and disseminated in that very particular um, time. Just as man's knowledge reflects nature, i.e., developing matter, which exists independently of him, so man's social knowledge, i.e., his various views and doctrines philosophical, religious, political, and so forth, reflects the economic system of society. Political institutions are a superstructure on the economic foundation. We see, for example, that the various political forms of the modern European states serve to strengthen the domination of the bourgeoisie over the proletariat. Marx's philosophy is a consummate philosophical materialism which has provided mankind, and especially the working class, with powerful instruments of knowledge. So that's the first section there on, on materialism. And that last bit there about, um, you know, the superstructure um, is, is really critical, not just for understanding the argument that Lenin is making, but maybe later when we get to him, some of the criticisms of Lenin's political philosophy um, but the idea essentially of the superstructure is that you have the base, which is like the economic system, and then the structures that are built out of it, right? I.e. the state, um, the legal system, all these things that come out of that. Um, those become the, the superstructure and they sit on top of the economic base. So even though they sort of you know, reach out into other aspects of, of society that you might not necessarily consider to be directly connected to the economic base itself. They grow out of the economic base. Um, a re, a, an example of this might be property rights uh, for, for women. Um, and it's very important to sort of keep um, women in the home um, in early capitalism to have them do that kind of socially necessary labor to reproduce, um, you know, to, to reproduce the working people, meaning like the cooking, the cleaning, all that kind of unpaid labor that capitalism has been built on, right? Um, you know, the, the, the way that the legal system treated women was as second class citizens, they couldn't own property, et cetera, right? So it's not necessarily like the boss themselves are saying, um, you know, women can't own property or anything like that. But the necessity of like having women sort of being second class um, citizens not being able to um, enjoy the same property rights as other people sort of was baked into the economic necessity. Now that shifts later in, in, in capitalism. Um, and, and this is the point is like, these are not sort of still systems when women need to be, when the capitalist system is particularly in America starts to decline um, to such a point, right? When, when profitability starts to go into crisis sixties plus, you see this kind of mass movement and, and, and shift in those kind of, of rights, um, you know, that, that women enjoyed um, both like social rights um, and, and, and political rights, because there was the need to incorporate people into the like larger capital system as workers. Um, and, you know, I don't know, like, um, I mean, there, like this, this is just the way to sort of understand that kind of relation and, and what that actually means in concrete um, terms, right? Um, so, you know, these things sort of grow out of it. That doesn't mean that every single interaction and every single thing does not have its own kind of unique historical contingencies. Um, but as a kind of general rule, general understanding, this is how this kind of thing develops. So that's number one component of Marxism. Number two um, is coming up next. Two. Having recognized that the economic system is the foundation on which the political superstructure is erected, 
Marx devoted his greatest attention to the study of this economic system. Marx's principal work, Capital, is devoted to a study of the economic system of modern, i.e., capitalist, society. Classical political economy, before Marx, evolved in England, the most developed of the capitalist countries. Adam Smith and David Ricardo, by their investigations of the economic system, laid the foundations of the labor theory of value. Marx continued their work, he provided a proof of the theory and developed it consistently. He showed that the value of every commodity is determined by the quantity of socially necessary labor time spent on its production. Where the bourgeois economists saw a relation between things, the exchange of one commodity for another, Marx revealed a relation between people. The exchange of commodities expresses the connection between individual producers through the market. Money signifies that the connection is becoming closer and closer, inseparably uniting the entire economic life of the individual producers into one whole. Capital signifies a further development of this connection, man's labor power becomes a commodity. The wage worker sells his labor power to the owner of land, factories, and instruments of labor. The worker spends one part of the day covering the cost of maintaining himself and his family, wages, while the other part of the day he works without remuneration, creating for the capitalist surplus value, the source of profit, the source of the wealth of the capitalist class. The doctrine of surplus value is the cornerstone of Marx's economic theory. Capital, created by the labor of the worker, crushes the worker, ruining small proprietors and creating an army of unemployed. In industry, the victory of large-scale production is immediately apparent, but the same phenomenon is also to be observed in agriculture, where the superiority of large-scale capitalist agriculture is enhanced, the use of machinery increases and the peasant economy, trapped by money capital, declines and falls into ruin under the burden of its backward technique. The decline of small-scale production assumes different forms in agriculture, but the decline itself is an indisputable fact. By destroying... There's just some things that are, are worth like highlighting to make sure that everybody's following along. Um, one, you just have to note, as Professor Wolf makes this point all the time, that yes, it's, it's Smith and Ricardo um, who are behind the labor theory of value. People always ascribe that to Marx, but Marx was actually just trying to develop out of it. Um, but um, because there's two points here, and the last bit is all about surplus value and, and, and capital. And he's using terms that like, you know, if you're familiar with them, you know exactly what he's saying. If you're not, you might not. So just really quickly, this point that he's making, this is the fundamental exploitation of, of capitalism, is that you just imagine the typical wage worker, they go in and their labor creates value, right? They put the things together. Without that, they're just things sitting around. Um, that the capitalist then takes the products of that person's labor and, and, and sells it and in return gives them a wage, right? But the wage structure is not set up to be, um, <laughs> um, you know, beneficial uh, to, to the worker. Um, in fact, uh, what capitalism actually does is it, the vast majority of people's times on the job is creating what is called surplus value for the owner, right? There's the initial part of the, the work that you do when you're at your job, which is creating the value that is sort of um, what is returned to you in a wage, right? But you exceed that by far. You know, a great example of this, I can't remember, there's been this like really funny trend. I don't know if you've seen this, Matt, like in like Midwestern towns where uh, like pizza chains or pizza restaurants will be like, today's like the workers day. And today, like all of the pr profits that the workers <laughs> make, like they get to keep. Have you seen this? And it was like, oh my God, what a wonderful thing. This, these guys are making $80 an hour. It's like, yeah. Um, they fucking do that every day and some asshole takes that money from them, right? This is, I, yeah. what I'm saying is like, this is like, I mean, it's, I guess it's nice for people to have more That's money. That's dangerous. Money, but the, one, it's dangerous because it actually is just showing like all of this economic production that we're doing on a like regular basis. Um, it's all going to line the pockets of, of somebody else. And like, you know, we talk about things like minimum wage and higher wages for workers. If you eradicated the capitalist class from the system of production, yeah, people would be, you know, like pizza makers would be making $50, $60 an hour, right? And the point there is that what's returned to you in the wage um, is a small, um, a small portion of the value that you create in the day. And the vast majority of the value that you create in the working day is what's called surplus value. And the surplus value becomes really, really um, important. Um, 
later in this kind of formulation. But this is a key, key Marxism here that um, I wanted. I love this text so much because it's really short. You know, you can read it a couple of times to maybe get all the points here, but it's really, really short and accessible. Um, but it really, yeah, it really boils down a lot of key parts of, of Marxism. So the point is not just that your boss is a jerk, blah, blah, blah. It's that literally the way that the system functions um, is just by taking way more from you than you get back from all the stuff that you create in the day, which is fundamentally um, ridiculous. But we'll get into what this means because like people oftentimes they only think about it on like, because the system would not just fix itself. For example, if you were just paid personally, um, you know, your rightful wage on the job. And this is this really critical point that, 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 that I made. By destroying small scale production, capital leads to an increase in productivity of labor and to the creation of a monopoly position for the associations of big capitalists. Production itself becomes more and more social hundreds of thousands and millions of workers become bound together in a regular economic organism but the product of this collective labor is appropriated by a handful of capitalists. Anarchy of production, crises, the furious chase after markets and the insecurity of existence of the mass of the population are intensified. By increasing the dependence of the workers on capital, the capitalist system creates the great power of united labor. Marx traced the development of capitalism from embryonic commodity economy, from simple exchange, to its highest forms, to large-scale production. And the experience of all capitalist countries, old and new, year by year demonstrates clearly the truth of this Marxian doctrine to increasing numbers of workers. Capitalism has triumphed all over the world, but this triumph is only the prelude to the triumph of labor over capital. So maybe let's see, and you know, I'm sorry, Matt, if I'm talking too much. Um, no, no. Because um, th this is, what, what does he mean? He, Lenin says, capital created by labor of the worker crushes the worker, ruining small proprietors and creating an army of unemployed, right? There's a lot in that sentence. What is he saying? Capital is something that is created. And one of the most critical things that you have to understand, this is not just like Marxism, this is just like economics, is understanding that, well, most of us, when we hear the word capital, we think of like money. Um, there are all sorts of things that are capital, right? Um, you know, it, it's things that go into production. It's buildings. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's value of a company. It's right. All, all of these kind of structures that are involved in the production, um, in, in the system of production, are capital. Um, but at the end of the day, the transition from feudalism to capitalism is actually the creation of capital. And what is the creation of capital from? It's the vast majority of it is created through labor, through work. Um, so this is the kind of fundamental contradiction. This is when the people say the fundamental contradiction of capitalism. This is it. This is the fundamental contradiction of capitalism is that capital, which is created by the workers, is used to crush labor. Because um, even if once these things start sort of populate, once once capital at large starts sort of populating like the the national economy, right? It even starts to destroy um, small scale the small scale production that initially created the capital in the first place, right? Like capitalism doesn't start off with large factories, right? Um, but that's where it sort of runs to the fact one of the, the fundamental truths of capitalism is that capital sort of tends to accumulate in the hands of a few, right? Because that's how the system is sort of set up as we were talking about the relationship between the laborer and the boss, right? So the kind of fundamental contradiction of, of, of capitalism is that in this early stage, you have all these people creating, creating, creating value, creating value, creating value. Um, and then that value eventually um, gets accumulated in a few hands and then gets brought back harshly against the people who created that that value in the first place and then across um you know no history right you know what i mean like small scale production transitions a few of those people start to transition to large scale production and then that large scale production then mm -hmm. completely destroys the initial small scale production right so capitalism is like an extremely destructive system um and it's a system that you know fundamentally was created off of of our labor right this is Beyond the unfairness, beyond the like not being able to afford rent, beyond people going hungry, all of these other things um, that are truly immoral about the system and wrong about the system, this right here, that fundamental contradiction of capitalism, that's the beating heart 
of of the Marxist critique of the Leninist critique of of, of capitalism. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think there's there's a lot there, but I, I hope that, that 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 makes it a little clearer for folks because obviously there's yeah there's a lot that goes into it. But we got one more one more key component of Marxism. <laughs> Three, when feudalism was overthrown and free capitalist society appeared in the world, it at once became apparent that this freedom meant a new system of oppression and exploitation of the working people. Various socialist doctrines immediately emerged as a reflection of and protest against this oppression. Early socialism, however, was utopian socialism. It criticized capitalist society, it condemned and damned it, it dreamed of its destruction, it had visions of a better order and endeavored to convince the rich of the immorality of exploitation. But utopian socialism could not indicate the real solution. It could not explain the real nature of wage slavery under capitalism, it could not reveal the laws of capitalist development, or show what social force is capable of becoming the creator of a new society. Meanwhile, the stormy revolutions which everywhere in Europe, and especially in France, accompanied the fall of feudalism, of serfdom, more and more clearly revealed the struggle of classes as the basis and the driving force of all development. Not a single victory of political freedom over the feudal class was won except against desperate resistance. Not a single capitalist country evolved on a more or less free and democratic basis except by a life and death struggle between the various classes of capitalist society. The genius of Marx lies in his having been the first to deduce from this the lesson world history teaches and to apply that lesson consistently. The deduction he made is the doctrine of the class struggle. People always have been the foolish victims of deception and self-deception in politics, and they always will be until they have learned to seek out the interests of some class or other behind all moral, religious, political, and social phrases, declarations and promises. Champions of reforms and improvements will always be fooled by the defenders of the old order until they realize that every old institution, however barbarous and rotten it may appear to be, is kept going by the forces of certain ruling classes. And there is only one way of smashing the resistance of those classes, and that is to find, in the very society which surrounds us, the forces which can and, owing to their social position, must constitute the power capable of sweeping away the old and creating the new, and to enlighten and organize those forces for the struggle. Marx's philosophical materialism alone has shown the proletariat the way out of the spiritual slavery in which all oppressed classes have hitherto languished. Marx's economic theory alone has explained the true position of the proletariat in the general system of capitalism. Independent organizations of the proletariat are multiplying all over the world, from America to Japan and from Sweden to South Africa. The proletariat is becoming enlightened and educated by waging its class struggle, it is ridding itself of the prejudices of bourgeois society, it is rallying its ranks ever more closely and is learning to gauge the measure of its successes, it is stealing its forces and is growing irresistibly. Hey. <clears throat> the monotone uh, reading doesn't really hit all the fire that he's <laughs> getting at, but I mean, I hope that that puts a little, you know, hair on your chest or, you know, blood in your cheeks or something. Um, I, I mean, I, I, this, I think this text is just a really brilliant synthesis of, of Marxism in general, right? Cause you get like the kind of general philosophical method, and then you get it applied to the current system, and then you get it applied to politics, which is one of the great um, innovations of, of certainly of Marx. But this is where Lenin sort of like is—I don't know—teaching the you know the, that that early young child of, of like Marxism, this young philosophy at this point, like how to stand on its own two feet as a political um, movement. Um, I think the the criticisms of utopian socialism are are so right and. Um, you know, because the point about utopian socialism is not that it wasn't passionate enough, not that these people didn't care enough, um, but that it did not have the kind of understanding that is necessary to make it class conscious of itself. Um, While well, I was always sort of sputtering around because of that. Yeah, I mean, just to, there was a bunch of utopian socialist experience stateside. Um, and it was mainly like bourgeois uh, folks that mm -hmm. like, had good intentions. And um, also like land uh, that they could go to going to try and like, let's work our way. And in, in certain cases, like um, I think s some lucked uh, into it. I forget the name, the shakers, I believe 
uh, mm. he, around the American Revolution, they were making their carpenters and their carpentry was re- really prized, right? And so they're like actually like, making something people wanted to, to buy. But ultimately, like, you know, there's there's a limitation that comes with that. Those were my um, people. And that was the best, like, that was the best example. The, the Shakers were way better than like the um, Brook Farm folks that, you know, had hope, you know, didn't quite. It was, it was mainly just romantics. Um, yeah. Well, it just, I mean, it's just funny, Matt, because it's like, I don't know if you've heard this from people before, but I don't know, not to point fingers too much at folks, but it's always this kind of like, you know, bourgeois, you know, upper middle class person who would say something to me, especially when I was younger, and be like, oh, I'm a socialist. And I remember this one guy looking at me one time, you know, I made some money very comfortable. was like, well, I think what they should be doing was let all the real capitalists, all the libertarians, they just get their own town and they get to live it under their own rules. And they get all the socialists and then they get their own town and they live it under their own rules and see which one works, see which one survives. And like that kind of perspective, one is, you know, incredibly condescending and silly. Um, but secondly, like just like taking their own logic on its um, right, like take their own logic um, and, and sort of deconstruct it. And you can see it's an extremely like, um, you know, bourgeois liberal way of, of viewing um, what we're talking about because what we're talking about is something very different um, than just necessarily like fairness or efficiency. Um, we're talking about class struggle, right? We're talking about societies and systems that sort of are born out of a, uh, you know, a, a, a fundamental system that separates people into two different classes. And you're not going to be able to rectify that by just um, you know going off into the desert in Utah and growing corn, right? Um, <laughs> it's just right. It, it, and and I think I was telling you about this yesterday, but on the stream on the Griscom stream on Tuesday, I, I read some of the early documents of the American Social Democratic Party, right, which is the precursor to the Socialist Party. Um, and there was actually this very same distinction between the socialists and the anarchists of this movement, where the anarchists they want to go out west and take advantage of cheap you know, land and, you know, maybe buy a mine for, you know, a few bucks and sort of run it as a, as a cooperative um, versus the socialists who wanted to take political power in society at large. Um, And I think that like that kind of idea that you can just sort of separate yourself from society is not just utopian um, in, in, in that sense, but you can see why it doesn't have, uh, doesn't have the legs to sort of deliver, you know, the salvation for people. Well, the surplus value angle is really important in that, like, if you're separating yourself from the capitalist, it means you're separating yourself from the shit you made, right? This is like Tim Pool Pool talking about, like, well, if you don't like your feudal master, just leave. Well, it's like, I fucking built the bridge. Yeah. He's going to send his, like, horse and carriage uh, to t- track me down and imprison me <laughs> in, the, in the tower that I also built, um, it, right? So it's like, yeah, you can leave leaving a hot behind a lot of wealth you created and starting from nothing. And also they will always crush you in the large scale. So like even if, you know- With you, your you, own shit, right? With like your with own the, shit that like the products your of the created, own. yeah. Like even if you go out and like you do create a, a, you know, I don't know. I'm trying to think of two level production out West, like- uh, let's say you go out and you're able to like mine for ore um, out west, and then you're able to turn that into steel, right? Um, and and to sell it, even if you find a way like internally to do it in a way that's not exploitative to your workers and to continue to you know to function, if you're still trying to sell that on the open American capitalist market, you're gonna get crushed. Um, and and the point here is not that there is some unbreakable iron law of exploitation that like sort of needs to be upheld um, to make things, but that capital accumulation creates a system where um, the people who have accumulated all that capital can use that, that power that they have to crush out any kind of competition. I mean, capitalism just fundamentally trends uh, toward monopoly. And this is like all, you know, this kind of like very American too idea that like, if we just break up the monopolies, things are going to be better um, is, is, is bogus as well, because um, one, it always trends toward, demo- uh, t- toward a monopoly, right? Cause that's just how it works. Cause it just makes sense. That's just how, um, you know, it's it, efficiency, it's efficiency, which is a good thing. That's actually not a value that we should be against, right? It makes sense. Um, you know, to to grow the the, the cotton and to make the t-shirts from the cotton, right? All the same place. 
Um, you know, you don't need to be sending that all across the country, um, you know, to, to, to make that happen. So like, you know, monopoly just tends to happen. Um, and again, like that's more of a natural law than, than anything else. It was the point is, is that, um, you know, you can't opt out of the system at large. Um, one, I think, as Matt, I think, rightfully points out earlier, is that <laughs> it's your shit. So you shouldn't have to opt out in the first place. <laughs> and two, because sooner or later, it's going to come back for you, right? You know, sooner or later, you're going to have to interact with the system of hyperaccumulation. Um, sooner or later, you're going to have to deal with that problem. And it doesn't matter how many models you create outside of it. You're going to have to deal with it, um, which is why, again, like I throw my lot in with the Lenins um, versus like the kind of, you know, colonization, utopian socialist movements. As much as I respect them and like personally, like, man, I have like the most Bacala kind of fantasies for myself. Um, where I just roll out of here and I raise some cattle with some friends and, you know, grow some food and take care of each other. And I think that's a really, really lovely life. Um, but I don't find that to necessarily be a political movement that's going to sort of break the power of the system. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Well, we have this other text. Um, it's a little bit longer, but the meat of it is shorter, if that makes sense. How do you think we should do it? Or should we come yeah, back? Yeah, if you want to. Wanna, well, that's the thing is I, I thought maybe we'd break this up into two parts and do it in full. Because I, 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 I'm, but I'm, a, I'm indulgent like that. Like I like giving people the option to listen to the full thing. Uh, I think we should come back to it because there's a lot to digest. Maybe we could do a couple more minutes sort of talking about the, this text then. Um, Cause there's a lot to come back to with this next text um, mm -hmm. that I think if you let this kind of percolate within yourself for, you know, a week when we, when we record the second episode, um, you're really going to understand like, so here's the theory and like the next text we're going to read. If you've already read it, um, then, you know, is like the analysis um so like this is like here are like the kind of fundamental understandings about how society works um and then the the next text is sort of like bringing that to the soviet situation to the american situation um but i don't know if like i'm trying to think of some top line things for this i mean obviously you get the one two three which i think is very helpful um i want i just want to make sure because i've i took a lot of notes um I think the, the most critical part of this text, if you were to just, if you felt like you didn't get it and you need to come back to it a few times, reading section two is probably one of the better encapsulations of like Marx, of like capital that you're going to get. And I mean, how many words is that? It's like <laughs> 500 words, maybe. So if the size of capital is very scary for you, I feel like, you know, just like spending some time with, uh, with that bit would be very helpful. Yeah, and I uh, I want to um, <clears throat> I'm gonna mute you for a second. Um, I want to um, go over the very opening and put that in the context of the CRT shit we're talking about, which I believe is like a a sort of like funky uh, red scare. Um, but throughout the civilized world, the teachings of Marx evoke the utmost hostility and hatred of all bourgeois science, both official and liberal, which regards Marxism as a kind of pernicious sect. And no other attitude is to be expected, uh, for there can be no impartial social science in a society based uh, on class struggle. I mean, this this is why I that this is true is probably what led me to Marxism um, and like this Lenin, Lenin and any sort of like basically communist writer because this is just apparent when you study history and like my favorite example is the way they took. Uh, Orwell saying he's a democratic socialist out of the animal farm uh, introduction. Like, and, and th that's just one of so many examples. I mean, everyone mm -hmm. else knows the famous one about the um, sort of uh, the, the image we get of MLK, right? Like the don't bring up race M guy, right? <laughs> like, right. And, and the guy who uh, the, you get, you don't get his anti-poverty stuff at all. It's just evident that that is the, it's a guy interested in ideas like myself. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the intellectual dark web and and it points back to you know the folks who saw it coming uh, and I think that is that, 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 that part is just I think awesome I agree and I mean it, it is so funny to think that this is even before um, this kind of model was able to present itself as like a viable alternative right like Marxism was scary before like Marxism 
I don't know, was embodied in really any form of, of government. I guess, I guess that's not true. In, in a sense, you have to say that, um, you know, the, the, the parish communes are sort of outgrowth of, of this early communist the movement. Specter. But, yeah. but I mean, you know, we grew up in a time where we know about Cuba and China and Vietnam and, and, and the Korean war and, and, and the Soviet union. Like we know like the kind of things that they, they get worked up about. Um, and it is amazing. I mean, this text was, you know, was suppressed by the SARS government, which is phenomenal too. Um, is because frankly, I mean, obviously there's a lot of polemic and, and demands in here. Um, but it, it is frankly an economic text. <laughs> I mean, sorry, a, a, a educational text first and foremost, um, yeah, and I love the part about there being no impartial social science in a society based on class struggle. I think that that George that, Mason economics that that is just something that people just really need to, that kind of concept is something that people really need to disabuse themselves of. Um, that we're like neutrality in, in and of itself is, is a good thing. I mean, journalism is a phenomenal example of, of that. Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to get worked up on some Twitter shit, but I guess it's like we, we did our smart thing for a second so we can have a little bit of fun. Um, you know, I, I made a tweet yesterday about Shama Sawan, and it's one of those things that gets so funny when it sort of goes out, when something gets shared enough that it sort of goes outside of like the left socialist little internet bubble that we're Exit in. Exit velocity, yeah. And then you just get wackos out there who are, because I basically I framed the recall election on Sawan um, as reactionary. Because it is, and it's right wing, yes. and they're like, "Well, excuse me, sir. Seattle is the most liberal, um, you know, city in the country, the most left of center city in, in in the country." And I'll tell you one thing: if that's true, that scares the hell out of me, right? If this is <laughs> yeah. like, if this is like the culmination of like left victory, um, see, and I don't mean this in any way to insult the people of Seattle as much as to say, like, that's a very frightening kind of end of history perspective to think. Um, that like, you know, nor New York state, for example, another state that's controlled by the democratic party, um, you know, is sort of yeah. some kind of, uh, reaching of, of, of u utopia. But what I mean by this is that like, you were, I was interacting with some people who were trying to be impartial about the situation and just talk of about course, the yeah. facts. Right. But if you think for a second, um, that the democratic party, the vast majority of the democratic party represents like the left, right. And our own and our tribe. That's not an impartial perspective. Um, that is that is very much trying to like impose a kind of small-minded American head. And I don't think it's on purpose. I think this is really how people think. Um, but uh, what I'm saying is like these people who are like striving for impartiality in their analysis, right? I'm so truthful, um, are truly actually being some of the biggest ideologues that you could could be because they're seeing the very small spectrum of like political activity in America as representative of like the entirety of, of, of political opinion or political opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just think um, for all the talk of the PMC uh, and I guess they're somewhat related to this, but the urban property owning class is uh, that's the, that's the class I'm interested in here and going to war yeah. with. Cause that's, that's the people spreading all the sh uh, fear mongering shit about DAs. That's, that's, you know, the people recalling Shama Sawant. Like these are the, these are, and they get, a, they get such a pass. They get such a fucking pass. They do. They country. do. Like they are flying deep stealth under that radar and just bombing the shit out of everything. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> right like like because it's everyone would just think it's like fox news right and, but these motherfuckers these are the cuomo people these are the like like this is why the money candidate always wins like statewide elections and democratic parties it's because mm -hmm. of these motherfuckers um and i i you know it looks like Sham is going to win. Um, she's the nose. Oh, does up. it? That's good. I, I did not know that. Or at least the nose up. I don't, I don't know to say that she's going to win, but at least like the, I saw the no was up. Which I mean, uh, they'll know because this will go up on Sunday, so people will know. Um, I hope. But like, I mean, what a great victory that would be. Um, and and uh, and what we need to take from it is just more um, definition on these motherfucking vampires <laughs> um, that would go after her. Yeah. I, I mean, on top of Amazon and stuff too, obviously. But. I absolutely um, agree. And again, this is why sometimes, even though engaging in kind of discourse or political debate it, it, in, in our kind of contemporary situation can be really, really frustrating. This is why I get a lot of happiness um, from returning to Lenin from, from time to time. 
uh, because I think it sort of arms you with the clarity that is critical, that is very necessary. But also for fuck's sake, I mean, this is just somebody who gets you excited about being um, in this process. Um, I wanted to, um, uh, I, I just, I know we're going to read this text next week, but I just want to give some people a little bit of flavor, maybe as a, um, you know, a little teaser for next week. We're going to read this really phenomenal text by Lennon, um, Letter to the American Workers, which he sent five years later. Actually, this is something that is worthwhile saying before we go. Um, Lennon writes this piece, what, 1913? This is before the the, the Russian Revolution. The czars um, are, are trying to suppress Lenin's writings. Um, Lenin is exiled, you know, could potentially never see his, his home um, and continues fighting. And who would have thought that just five years later, he would have been writing this triumphant letter to the American working class, um, you know, hoping that one day that they can join him on the other side of, of revolution, this global proletarian um, revolution. I'm just saying is that like, you know, people get really worked up about time and the passage of time and how much time we have to go through, blah, blah, blah. The world moves in, in in very fascinating ways, and there's times where it seems like nothing at all is moving, and then there are, are weeks uh, when you know the whole world moves. And um, I just think that it's important, like having a, a long term perspective is critical. Understanding where we are at is critical, but you don't have to fall into this kind of trap of like I have to think gener generationally or something like that, um, um, because things just happen in really extraordinary ways. I just, I don't know. Whenever you get really down and you think that nothing's happening, nothing's moving, just like remember that Lenin was hanging out thinking that Lenin actually, I can't remember when he wrote this, but it was post 1905. Lenin wrote like in a journal or a letter to a comrade, something like, I'm just so sad that I'll never see a, a workers' revolution in my lifetime. Um, and, you know, thankfully he was wrong about that. I'm just saying, like, you know, these things can move quickly. Um, but let me read this right quick for y'all as a, as a, as a farewell. Um, this is towards the end of the letter. He says, he's talking about the uh, attacks on the Soviet Union from the Americans um, and the imperialist powers, despite the fact that they had sort of, people forget this, that the, the Americans uh, were supporting the white army, the reactionary anti-Soviet army. Um, a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't know that. But we anyway, don't seem to talk about that that much. We do not. Um, in, yeah, exactly. Like you want to talk about like uh, the Cold War without the context of the fact that the, immediately when the system started, the Americans were trying to destroy it from the outside. <laughs> um, anyways, in spite of this, we are firmly convinced that we are invincible because the spirit of mankind will not be broken by the imperialist slaughter. Mankind will vanquish it. And the first country to break the convict chains of the imperialist war was our country. We sustained enormous heavy casualties in the struggle to break these chains, but we broke them. We are free from imperialist dependence. We have raised the banner of struggle for the complete overthrow of imperialism for the whole world to see. Um, yeah, some words to live by, some excitement. Um, and we're looking forward to jumping into this uh, next week with all of y'all. Thanks for hanging out with us. <laughs>